stop it. Okay, here we go. Odyssey Book 20, read by Matthew Rammer. Odysseus lay down to sleep on the outer porch. He spread out an uncured oxide, and on top of that, he layered fleeces from many sheep that were always being slaughtered from there in the house, uh, his house. Euronome covered him with a cloak, and there he lay, sleepless, his mind racing with thoughts of how to punish the suitors. And then the women came from the house on their way, as usual, to sleep with the suitors, laughing with each other and giggling. Odysseus felt his chest tighten. He brooded for a long time over what he should do. Rush out and kill every last one of them? Or let them sleep with the arrogant bastards? This one last time he growled under his breath, the way a dog standing over her pup growls when she sees a stranger and digs into a fight. So Odysseus growled at their iniquity, but he slapped his chest and scolded his heart. Endure, my heart, you endured worse than this on that day when the invincible Cyclops ate your comrades. You bore it until your cunning got out of the cave where you thought you would die. In this way, Odysseus scolded his heart, and his heart in obedience beat steady and strong, but the great hero himself tossed and turned. It was like a man roasting a paunch stuffed with fat and blood over a fire. He can't wait for it to be done, and so he keeps turning it over and over. Odysseus, tossing and turning as he ponders how to get his hands on the shameless suitors, one man against many, and then Athena came down from the sky and stood above his head in the form of a woman and spoke to him. Why are you sleepless, most, why are you sleepless, most ill-fated men? This is your house, and in your, this house are your wife and child, a son any father would hope for. And Odysseus, his mind teeming, Yes, goddess, all you say is true. My heart is brooding over this. How to get my hands on this on the shameless suitors, alone as I am, against the whole pack of them, and worse, even if I were to kill them, by your will and the will of Zeus, how would I get out of it? Think about that. And Athena's and Athena, eyes flashing in the dark. Let it go, Odysseus. Some people trust their puny hum human friends more than they trust more than you trust me. And here I am, a goddess, protecting you in all your trials. To put it plainly, even if there were fifty squadrons of men, armed men, all around us, doing their mortal best to kill us, you would still be able to run off their cattle. Now get some sleep. Staying up all night will only sap your strength. All your troubles, Odysseus, will soon be over. Athena spoke and shed sleep on his eyelids, and then she was off to Olympus, a being of light. When Odysseus slept, he, his cares melted away under the spell of sleep. His wife sp awoke, and she wept as she sat upon her soft bed. When her heart had its fill of weeping, the godlike woman prayed to Artemis. Artemis, mighty daughter of Zeus, please shoot an arrow into my breast and take my life this very moment. This is my wish, or that a storm wind snatch me away and bear me off over the gloomy passes, and cast me down at the mouth of the ocean, as winds bore off from Pandarus, Pandarius's daughters, the gods had slain their parents and were left orphans in the halls. Aphrodite fed them cheese, sweet honey, and mellow wine. Hera made them wise and beautiful, beyond all women. Holy Artemis made them tall, and Athena taught them glorious handiwork. But when Aphrodite was off to high Olympus to arrange their marriages on her way to Zeus, the high lord of thunder, who knows all, all the good and bad fortune of mortal men, the storm spirits snatched the girls away and gave them as slaves to the hateful furies. So may the Olympians blot me out, or Artemis in her tall headdress shoot me, that I may pass beneath the hateful earth with Odysseus in my mind's eye, never to be, never to gratify the heart of a lesser man. Grief is unendurable when one weeps by day, but can sleep at night. 
Sleep makes us forget all things, both good and the bad. Once it that shrouds our eyelids, but some spirits keep keep sending me bad dreams. This very night there was there slept with me again someone who looked just like Odysseus when he left with the army, and my heart was glad because I did not think it was a dream, but the waking truth at last. She spoke, and dawn came, seated on gold. Odysseus heard Penelope's voice as she wept, and in that moment, between sleep and waking, he felt in his heart that she had him, she had, she knew him already, and was standing beside his head. He picked up the cloak and fleeces on which he had slept, and put them on a chair in the hall. Then he took the ox hide outside and set it down, and lifted his palms to the sky. He prayed to Zeus. Father Zeus, if it was the gods' will to bring me home over land and sea after afflicting me, show me a sign. Let someone of those stirrings inside the house speak for me a word of good omen, and send me a sight also from the open sky. Zeus, in his wisdom, heard his prayer and thundered from snow-capped Olympus. High above the clouds, Odysseus was glad, and the women uttered a word of omen as she, as she ground at the mill nearby in the house. Twelve women in all worked the mills there, grinding barley and wheat into flour, the morrow of men. The other women, their wheat ground, were sleeping now, as she, the weakest of them, was still at it. Stopping her mill, she spoke these words, Father Zeus, Lord of gods and men. That was a loud thunderclap out of a clear sky. You must be showing someone a sign. Will you answer an old woman's prayer? Let this be the last and final day the suitors feast in Odysseus' halls. All I've broken my back grinding their grain. Let this meal be their last. Odysseus smiled at this omen and at, and at the thunder from Zeus. He would have his vengeance. The other women were up now, huddled together, as they kindled the, to the day's fire on the hearth. Telemachus rose from bed, a godlike man, and got dressed. He slung his sharp sword around one shoulder, tied fine leather sandals onto his supple feet and spear in hand went to the threshold and spoke to Euryclea. Dear nurse, have you looked after our guest, given him f a bed and food, or is he lying uncared for? That's my mother's style, wise as she is, honoring one man outrageously and sending a better man away neglected. And, Eur and Euryclea, with all her wits about her, don't blame her, child, when she is blameless. He sat, he sat and drank wine as long as he wanted, but he said he wasn't hungry. She asked him when he got tired and wanted to sleep. She told the women to make up a bed, but he, like many who are down on their luck, wouldn't sleep on a bed or under blankets. He lay on an undressed ox hide and some fleeces out on the porch, and we threw a cloak over him. Then Euryclea and Telemachus went out, spear in hand, and two, spear in hand, and two hounds at his heel to join the other men in public square. Then Euryclea, Pisenor's granddaughter, a noble woman, called to her maids, "Some of you get busy and sweep the halls, hall, and sprinkle it, and put the purple coverlets on the good chairs." and we'll need some others to sponge down the tables and wash the bowls and goblets. The rest of you go down and fetch water from the spring quickly. The suitors will be here early today. It's a feast day, a holiday for everyone. She spoke, and they did as she said. Twenty went down to the spring with its dark water, and the rest, of, and the rest did their work skillfully. Then in came the town's serving men. They started splitting logs, doing a good job of it. The women came back from the spring, and behind them came a swine herd, driving three prime boars, the herd's finest. 
She let them feed in the courtyard and then turned to Odysseus with a pleasant manner. Stranger, are you getting any more respect yet? Or are they still insulting you in the hall? And Odysseus, his, mind's, his mind teeming. Eumaeus, it is outrageous the way these men carry on in another man's house. May the gods punish them. They have no sense of shame. And this, after this exchange, Melanthius came up, the goat herd leading the best she-goats from all the herds for the suitor's feast. Two herdsmen followed him. He tethered the goats in the echoing port portico and then taunted Odysseus. Are you still there, pestering everyone? Why don't you get the hell outside? You and I are going to have, have to settle this with our fists. I don't like your way of begging. There are other feasts you can go to, you know. Odysseus made no response, but said, shaking his head and brooding darkly. And then a third herdsman came, Philoetius, <laughs> driving for the suitors, a barren heifer and fat she-goats. This livestock had been brought over along Philoetius by ferrymen, who plied the straits with all sorts of passengers. He tethered the animals in the echoing portico, and then went up to the swineherd and asked, Who is the new arrival, swineherd? Where does he say he comes from? And who are his parents and kinsmen? Poor guy, he looks like some kind of king, but the gods can make it tough for wanderers, wanderers even if they're royalty. He spoke and came up to Odysseus, stretched out his right hand and said, Welcome, stranger, and may good luck come your way. Hard as things are for you now, Father Zeus, no god curses us worse than you. You have no pity for men, you beget them, then plunge them into misery and pain. Stranger, I broke into a sweat when I saw you, and my eyes are full of tears. You remember me, you remind me of Odysseus. He is too, he too is clothed in rags like this. I suppose, and is a wanderer like you, if he is still alive, that is, and still sees the sunlight, and still sees the sunlight. But if he is already dead and has gone to Hades, then I weep for noble Odysseus. He put me in charge of his cattle when I was a boy in the, in the land of Cephalonians, and now those cattle are past counting. No breed, no breed... Uh, ever flourished like that for any mortal man, man. But now other men order me to derive them so they can eat them, and w with no regard at all for the sun in the house or the gods' wrath. No, they are hot to divide among themselves all the property of our long absent master. As for myself, I go around and around in my heart, trying to decide. It would be very bad of me, while my master's son still lives, to go off to some other place with my cattle to a foreign land. But it is worse still to s stay here and suffer, in charge of herds, in charge of herds handed over to others. I would have fled long ago, believe me, to some powerful lord, lord, because things here are no longer bearable. Except that I still imagine, still have some hope. That my unfortunate master will some day return and s scatter the suitors out of this house. And Odysseus, his mind teeming, you're a good man, cowherd, and smart, and I see that you understand things. So I will say something and seal it with an oath, with Zeus and all the gods above as witnesses, and by Odysseus's hearth and this table of hospitality to which I have come, I swear that while you are here, Odysseus. Uh, here, Odysseus will come home, and you will see, if you wish, the death of the suitors who lord it over this hall. In which the cowherd responded, May Zeus bring what you say to pass, stranger. Then, w then you would see what these hands can do. And you may as too pray to all the gods that wise Odysseus, that wise Odysseus might return to his home. So went their talk. The suitors, meanwhile, were laying plans for Telemachus's death, as, but as they talked, a bird appeared on their left, a high-flying eagle with a dove in its talons. 
This prompted Amphinomus to say, This plan of ours isn't going to work, friends. Killing Telemachus, we might as well just eat. And the, the suitors all agreed with Amphinomus. Going into the house of godlike Odysseus, they laid their cloaks on chairs and got busy slaughtering big sheep and plump goats and fatted swine. And the herds prized heifer. They roasted entrails, served them, and mixed wine in their in the bowls. The swine herd passed the cups. Uh, Philoetus uh, handed out bread from a beautiful basket, and Melanthius poured for them. They reached out to all the tasty dishes spread before them. Telemachus, pressing his advantage, showed Odysseus to a seat inside the great hall by the stone threshold. Giving him a shabby stool beside a little table, he served him a portion of the entrails and a cup of wine, and he said to him, Sit here among these heroes and sip your wine. I myself will protect you from, these, from their insults and keep their hands from you. This house is not a public inn, but a, the palace of Odysseus, who inherited it inherited it to pass on to me so all you suitors control yourselves i don't want any fights breaking out here they bit their lips at this and wondered at telemachus it had been a bold speech then antinius a up son said hard it is it hard as it is we'd better listen to him men telemachus really means business now if zeus hadn't allowed it We'd have shut his mouth by now, here in these halls, fine speaker or not. But Telemachus paid no attention to Antinous. Meanwhile, down in the town, heralds were leading a sacrifice of one hundred bulls through the streets, and Achaean, Achaean men, uh, through the streets, and Achaean men, their long hair flowing, we were gathered, gathering in a shady grove sacred to Apollo the god whose arrows strike from afar. In Odysseus's palace, they were now drawing the roasted meat from the spits and dividing it up for a glorious feast. The servers set out, set out a portion for Odysseus equal to the others. This at the command of Telemachus, god like Odysseus's own true son. But Athena was not about to let the suitors abstain from insults. She wanted the pain to sink deeper into Odysseus's bones. There was a particular arrogant suitor from the island of Same, <laughs> uh, Tessipus by name. This man, relying on his enormous wealth, courted the wife of the long-absent Odysseus. He spoke now among the insolent crowd. Hear me, suitors, I have something to say. The stranger here has been served a portion equal to ours. This is all as it should be. It would not be right to deprive any guest Telemachus entertains here in these halls. So I'd like to give him a gift myself, a little gr uh, gratitude he might want to pass on to the bathwoman or one of the other slaves who lives in the house of godlike Odysseus. So saying, he picked up an ox's foot hoof from a basket and threw it hard. Odysseus snapped his head aside and dodged it, smiling to himself, a grim and bitter smile. The ox's hoof crashed into a solid wall, and Telemachus tore into Thesipus. You're damned lucky you missed him, Thesipus, or rather that he dodged your throw, or I would have rammed my spear into your gut, and your father would have been busy with your funeral instead of making plans for a wedding. No more of this ugliness in my house from anyone. I understand that you I understand now what's going on around here. The good and the bad. I was a child before, but we still have to put it put up with all this. Seeing the sheep slaughtered, the wine drunk, the bread. One man can't stop many. You don't have to be hostile towards me uh, to me, but if you are determined to cut me down, well I'd rather be killed in cold blood than have to watch this disgusting behavior. Guests mistreated and men uh, dragging the women shamefully through these beautiful halls. Dead silence reigned in 
those beautiful halls until Agelaus, son of Damas, Damastor, said, Friends, no one should get angry at a speech justly spoken or respond to it harshly. We should stop mistreating the stranger and all the servants in Odysseus's house. But I would like to offer Telemachus and to his mother some friendly advice, and I hope that it gets through to both of them. As long as you still held hope in your hearts that Odysseus would find his way back home, no one can blame you for watching him and restraining the suitors. Clearly the better course had uh, he ever come back and returned to his home. But now it is clear he will never return. Sit down with your mother and tell her this. Tell her to marry the best of her suitors, whoever that is, whoever gives her the most, then you can enjoy what your father has left you. And she can keep another man's house. Telemachus answered in his cool-headed way, I swear by Zeus and by my poor father, who has either perished far from Ithaca or is wandering still, that I do not, Agelaus, uh, Agelaus, de delay my mother's marriage. On the contrary, I encourage her to marry the man of her choice, and I offer her a dowry of gifts past counting, but it would be, it would be shameful for me to order her to leave. May the gods forbid it against her own will. Thus Telemachus and thus Telemachus. And Pallas Athena touched the suitors' minds with hysteria. They couldn't stop laughing, and as they laughed it seemed to them that their jaws were not theirs, and the meat that they ate was dab dabbled with blood. Tears filled their eyes, and their hearts raced. And then Theoclamenus spoke among them. Wretches, what wicked thing is this that you suffer you are shrouded in night from top to shrouded in night from top to toe lamentation flares your cheeks melt with tears and the walls of the house are sp spattered with blood the porch on the court are crowded with ghosts streaming down to the undergloom the sun is gone from heaven and the evil mist spreads over the land thus the seer and they giggled at him Eurymachus was the first to actually speak. This newly arrived stranger has lost his mind. Quick, get him outside, since he thinks it's night in here. To which the seer Theoclamenus replied, I don't, I don't need any escorts, Eurymachus. I have eyes, ears, and my own two feet, and a mind in good working order. I'll leave under my own power, for I can see evil coming upon you, inescapable evil. For every last one of you, who is in your blind pride, do violence to the house of Odysseus. And with that, he left the great hall and went to uh, Pyrrhus, who took him in gladly. The suitors stu stood there smirking at each other and tried to provoke Telemachus by r ridiculing his guests with comments like these. Hey, Telemachus, you don't have much luck with the guests kind of hey telemachus you don't have much luck with the kind of guests you keep around you've got this filthy vagabond here that always wants a hangout of bread and wine and can't help out with anything a useless load then this other one posing as a prophet if you ask me we ought to throw them a ship and send them off to sicilians at least then you would turn a little profit. So so went their talk, but Telemachus ignored them, watching his father in silence, waiting for the moment when the, he would lay his hands on the shameless suitors. By now Penelope, Icarus's wise daughter, had set his, her chair across from the suitors. During all their laughter, they had been busy preparing their dinner, a tasty meal for which they had slaughtered many animals, but no meal could be more graceless than the one a goddess and a hero would serve to them soon. After all, they started the whole ugly business. And that was book 20. Uh, leave a like, comment, subscribe. Now leave a like because I'm reading it. I don't know. Bye.